The Oracle Network. Hi, true crime fans. I'm Erin. And I'm Shay. We host All Crime No Cattle, a conversational podcast which focuses on true crime stories from the Lone Star State. We strive to bring you a balanced and well researched story about Texas cases, big and small. We do the research so you don't have to. We also end every episode with a good news story, just to remind everyone that real life isn't quite as depressing as true crime can make it out to be. New episodes drop every Thursday, and you can find us wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. All crime, no cattle, because crime is bigger in Texas, y'all. Hey, hey, Rainbow Warriors. This is my disclaimer. Beyond the Rainbow is a true crime podcast. It's not suitable for young children, and maybe not even for some adults. I tend to swear like a sailor, and I'm kind of proud of that. Listener discretion is advised. Hey there, Rainbow Warriors, and welcome to Beyond the Rainbow, true crimes of the LGBTQ+. I'm your host, CJ. When you get a chance, please follow me on the socials. I'm on Facebook at Beyond the Rainbow, Twitter, TikTok, and Tumblr as Rainbow Crimes, Instagram as Rainbow Crimes 12, and YouTube as Rainbow Crimes Unicorn Justice. If you'd like to help this one woman researched, written, recorded, edited, and produced show, please take a look at my merch store under Rainbow Crimes at Tee Public. Another way to show your support is to buy me a cup of coffee. I love coffee. Buymeacoffee.com backslash rainbow crimes offers listeners a way to support the show without breaking the bank. Other great ways to support the shows you listen to is by leaving a five-star review. It helps the podcast algorithm gods and goddesses find the podcast. Gaining visibility for often overlooked victims of the LGBTQ plus community is my goal for Beyond the Rainbow. And finally, if you could please tell a friend, pass the word along. Let's get these stories heard. Thank you, my warriors. If you'd like to be a part of this show and tell of a missing but not forgotten LGBTQ plus person, please DM me on the socials or email me through my website at beyondtherainbowpodcast.com. From there, I will send you a script, and all you have to do is read it, record it, and email it back to me. You don't need fancy equipment. Just record it on your phone or computer. It's that simple. Before I jump into our missing but not forgotten for this mini-sode, I'd like to talk a bit about a gay man that both the missing segment and the Quickie Crime segment will center around this episode. He is art legend and filmmaker Andy Warhol. Andy was born Andrew Warhol. Some of you might remember back to the mysterious death of Jamie Stickle case that I covered months ago. She was the lesbian bartender that was burned to death in her Jeep, which was parked right outside of where she lived. In that episode, I mentioned Andy, and that his last name was actually Warhola, because Andy's cousin, also with the last name Warhola, was Jamie's landlord. So I just have to say, Warhola, out to the Warhola family. Andy Warhol's life seemed to be a bit controversial from the very day he was born. You see, Nobody's really sure when the exact day and place of his birth was. It's guessed that he was born August 6, 1928, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. However, his birth certificate wasn't filed until 1945, and it was filed in Pittsburgh. It seems that record-keeping back then was pretty loose. Andy ended up dropping the A on his last name, and that's because Glamour Magazine did a feature about his artistry. And when they did, there was a typo calling him Andy Warhol instead of Andy Warhola. Andy kind of liked this, and he followed suit going by Andy Warhol after that. For my younger listeners who might never have heard of Andy Warhol before, I'm pretty sure you've seen his art. 
Andy made pop art a thing in the 1960s. Silk screening was his medium, and he used it as his technique for painting pictures. Andy called his studio the factory, and it was in New York City. A couple of his most famous pieces of art was a Campbell's soup can and a very colorful picture of Marilyn Monroe using his pop art silkscreen method. Besides art, Andy dabbled in filmmaking and the music industry. He was working with a band called The Velvet Underground in the late 60s. The whole reason I wanted to give you warriors a little background to Andy Warhol is because this mini-sode's missing but not forgotten LGBTQ plus member was Andy's boyfriend, Danny Williams. Danny lived with Andy and Andy's mom at the factory. Danny was a 26-year-old film editor, and he went missing on July 25, 1966, from Rockport, Massachusetts. Danny had just completed filming a movie with Andy, and then Danny left to go see his family in Rockport. At the family dinner, an argument happened, and Danny left the family house and he was pretty upset. He just needed a drive or a walk to cool down some. He needed some time to reflect. Danny took his mom's car and he drove to Pigeon Cove by the sea in Rockport. That following day, his mom's car was found about 50 feet from the cliffs, but Danny was missing. If there was an accident and he slipped or if he jumped off a cliff into the sea, Danny's body has never washed onto shore. His family and friends find it really hard to believe that he'd take his own life. Danny didn't seem depressed, and his career was really starting to take off. Danny had everything to live for. When Andy was given the news of Danny's disappearance, he was very aloof to it, as if he didn't care one way or another if he was ever going to see Danny again. Those close to Andy said that's just how he was. He didn't really show any emotions. With this case, I don't have any phone numbers to give should anyone have any information, probably because the case is 55 years old. But if you'd like more information on this case, Danny's niece, Esther Robinson, is a filmmaker, because a must run in the family, and Esther has put together a film called A Walk into the Sea, Danny Williams and the Warhol Factory. I've seen bits and pieces in an interview with Esther. It looks like a pretty good production, so I think I can recommend it. Our true crime quickie this episode also revolves around Andy Warhol. In June of 1968, nearly two years after Danny disappeared, a woman waited outside the factory for Andy Warhol to appear. When he did, she walked into the factory with him. Then she got onto an elevator with him, his manager, Fred Hughes, and art critic Mario Amaya. Mid-ride of the elevator, the woman removed a thirty-two Beretta from her purse. She shot at Andy three times. The first two missed, but the third one struck him. She shot Mario once, but Mario was only minorly injured. And she tried to shoot Fred, but her gun jammed. And at this point, you have to be thinking what I'm thinking, warriors. Oh my god, you're in an elevator with someone. How the hell do you miss when you shoot the gun? Andy had to be rushed to the hospital. He had a ruptured stomach, spleen, liver, and lungs. He survived, but because of these injuries, he had to wear a surgical corset for the rest of his life. Andy had to consider himself lucky, though. The woman who shot him, she was trying to kill him. That woman was a lesbian named Valerie Solanus. I think it would be safe to say... Valerie didn't like men. At all. After shooting Andy and Mario at the factory, Valerie walked out of the factory and wandered around Times Square for a while. A little while later, she approached a New York police officer, and she confessed to him everything she did at the factory. She told the officer Andy Warhol had too much control over her life which is kind of a freaky thing to say about a man whom she had only briefly met once before. 
Three years earlier, Valerie had written a play called Up Your Ass, which is vulgar and it sounds like a great name for a play to me. Up Your Ass was a radical feminist play about a lesbian prostitute who would hustle men, and then she ended up killing one. Enter Eileen Warnos's life story, right? Anyway, Valerie had tried to get someone to fund and produce her play. She even submitted it to Andy Warhol, who, as I mentioned before, had his hands in all types of artsy projects. It seemed the name of her play and the premise was just too crude for people of that time era. No one wanted to be a part of it, including Andy. Valerie was not one to take no for an answer. She hounded Andy about producing her play. Andy finally gave in to Valerie, just a little bit. He wouldn't have anything to do with her play. He basically told her, shove the play up your ass. Instead, he gave her a minor role in one of his movies, and he paid her 25 bucks for her work. I believe Valerie felt her hard work on the Up Your Ass script was being shoved aside, and it wasn't being recognized for its greatness. So, in retaliation, Valerie started another project. Next up, Valerie wrote and self-published a book called The Scum Manifesto. S-C-U-M. SCUM stood for Society for Cutting Up Men. In the book, Valerie was calling for the elimination of men and the establishment of a utopian universe for women only. Some thought it was an attention-seeking gimmick, while others thought it was a feminist call to arms. This wasn't a gimmick for Valerie. It was her life mission. Valerie was also very angry Andy Warhol never returned her script for Up Your Ass. She started to believe men were trying to steal her ideas and take credit for them. All of this is what led up to Valerie's hit on Andy Warhol. After shooting Andy and Mario and confessing to the New York cop that Andy had too much control over her life, Valerie was arrested. She was charged for attempted murder, assault with a weapon, and illegal possession of a handgun. Valerie would undergo numerous psychiatric evaluations. She was diagnosed as paranoid schizophrenic, and she was institutionalized until she was deemed fit to stand trial for the crimes against Andy and Mario. Between hospitalization and prison, Valerie would serve only three years. She was released, and she resurfaced in the early 70s, but she was put back in psychiatric care when she started to threaten book publishers. Why did Valerie think she could only be a success if she threatened her way to it? What exactly was it that made Valerie tick the way she did? Valerie was born in New Jersey on April 9, 1936. Her parents divorced by the time she was four years old. After their separation, Valerie's mother sent Valerie and her younger sister to live with their grandparents in Atlantic City. This was until their mother got it together and was able to reclaim them and take care of them. Valerie had made claims to many of her future psychiatrists that her alcoholic father had sexually molested her as a child. Valerie's grandfather was also an alcoholic who physically abused and beat her. But in spite of all this turmoil, others had described Valerie as a bright and funny child. She had learned to play the piano at the age of seven, and she started to play popular songs of the time, and she would change the lyrics to make the songs silly and funny. As a young teenager, Valerie's mom remarried, and Valerie didn't like her new stepdad at all. This is when she started to display a rebellious side. Valerie was yanked out of her Catholic middle school for attacking a nun. At the age of 15, she ran away and she lived on the streets. It was at this time she became pregnant by an older, married sailor. Valerie gave birth to the baby. It was a boy, but her baby was taken from her and put up for adoption. Valerie was placed back with her mom and stepdad. Back in high school, 
Valerie was starting to get very bad grades, and she wasn't focused on her schoolwork at all. But then she started to explore her sexuality, and her grades rose. In college, Valerie worked in the psychology department's experimental animal laboratory. It's been speculated Valerie may have also been a sex worker, so she could earn enough money to pay for her tuition. The college did order Valerie to seek counseling several times while she was enrolled, mostly because Valerie had angry outbursts randomly. Thankfully, she was able to find an outlet for some of her bottled-up angst. She would submit articles to the college newspaper. Most of the articles she wrote had a satirical flair against sexism. Valerie ended up graduating college with a degree in psychology. Oh, the irony. And then Valerie attended the University of Minnesota for the master's program in psychology. She ended up only going for a year and then she dropped out. Valerie then hitchhiked to California before she returned back to New Jersey the following year. New York called to Valerie. She was a hippie at heart and she loved the artsy lifestyle of Greenwich Village. And not too long after her arrival to the Big Apple is where we place Valerie pitching her play Up Your Ass to Andy Warhol. And then the whole attempted murder ordeal, institutionalization of the early 70s and brief stints back to the mental hospital. We are now up to date on where we last left Valerie. By 1975, after Valerie had served her last time at a mental institution in New York, she dropped off the radar, and she moved out to Phoenix, Arizona. She was without a home, and she lived on the streets there. From there, Valerie moved to San Francisco. In San Francisco, she was able to find herself a small, tattered apartment, and that's where she was living when the news of Andy Warhol's death came on February 22, 1987. Just 15 months later, Valerie's landlord called upon her to collect her overdue rent. The landlord found Valerie dead from pneumonia. Up Your Ass was finally professionally staged in the year 2000 at the George Coates Theater in San Francisco. The critics were not crazy about it. They called it fun, but fundamentally flawed. Others said they thought it was adolescent and contrived. You know, Valerie's ghost is most likely haunting those critics now. Valerie Solanus also gained a brief post-mortem celebrity on American Horror Story. It was on season 7 called Cult in 2017. In it, actress Lena Dunham portrayed Valerie. And that pretty much sums up this minisode. Rest in power, Valerie and Andy. Love you, Rainbow Warriors. And remember... It's not a crime to be gay, unless you're a murderer. <laughs> <laughs>